Good day. Yesterday, I discussed the fact that even as I was making the video, there were reports of a major Russian missile strike on Ukraine, the latest now in a sequence that began on the 10th of October. Now, as is so often the case, there have been conflicting claims about the scale and effectiveness of this strike. I should say conflicting claims, though the Russian authorities themselves tend to say very little about these missile strikes. But we obviously have comments from the Ukrainian um, authorities and contrasting claims from what might be called informal Russian sources. That's the various Russian telegram channels and bloggers and people of that kind who have been busy reporting and discussing the war. Now, I did say yesterday, and I want to reiterate it today, that this is one of these increasingly complex, or if you like, sophisticated strikes. They're not just waves of cruise missiles. It's clear that ballistic missiles were used at one point. It's also clear that cruise missiles were used, launched from Tupel F-95 bombers operating in the Arctic, Arctic regions of Russia, near Murmansk, apparently. Um, I get the impression that drones were also used, that I'm not sure of the nature of these drones. And, of course, there's conflicting claims about the number of these missiles that were shot down. Um, again, my impression is that though some missiles undoubtedly were shot down, the majority got through and hit their targets. But that's, of course, only my own impression. Um, and, of course, there's also the question of where these strikes took place. It's interesting that this time the strikes don't seem to have honed in on western Ukraine. But as has been regularly the case now for a fairly long time, there does seem to have been a heavy concentration of strikes, missile strikes, on the odessa Nikolaev area. Why exactly this area of Ukraine is particularly subject to strikes, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing that it is an area where Western equipment arrives, is placed in warehouses, is sorted out and is then sent to the various battlefronts. And perhaps for that reason, the Russians have been paying particular attention to it. But let me say again, that is purely a guess. It's also clear that the strike had complex targets. It seems to have been focused both on attacks on the energy in infrastructure, Ukraine's <laughs> steadily deteriorating and constantly under pressure energy infrastructure. And even Ukrainian officials accept that severe damage was done to parts of that infrastructure. The, the Russians seem to be careful just to keep it ticking along. They don't seem at the moment to be aiming to knock it out entirely in one big strike. And I would reiterate again that way back at the start of these missile strikes in October, John Helmer wrote a piece on Dancing with Bears in which on the basis of advice given to him by an expert, he said that this is exactly the pattern that the Russians would follow, that they would keep the Ukrainian energy system ticking along at a degraded level. They would gain more and more information about it, the more strikes against it that they carried out. They would understand both how it works, how it's repaired, and what its weak points are. And then eventually, when the moment came, if they decided to knock it out, they would do so in one big strike. And that would probably be something that would happen in coordination with a big Russian offensive. So this is consistent with that analysis that Helmer was saying. And in addition, and moreover, We've had some very intriguing reports from the Ukrainians about the type of missiles used. Now, I should say that the Russians scarcely ever report the number of missiles they launch 
at Ukraine in any particular strike. But um, I get the impression that this was a big strike, but not one of the very biggest. So less than 80, perhaps, missiles altogether, perhaps significantly less than that. But I can't, again, speculate about this. But the Ukrainian military is claiming that one of the missiles that was used over the course of this strike was a Kinjal hypersonic missile. Now, this is intriguing and it does beg a lot of questions. Firstly, the obvious question, are the Ukrainians even right about this? I mean, there's, as I said, lots of missiles being launched by Russia. The bulk of them, apart from the Kalibre missile, which is launched by the Russian fleet, though I don't get the sense that these were much used in this particular missile strike, and my guess is, in fact, that perhaps they weren't used at all. But anyway, the bulk of the missiles that get launched over the course of these missile strikes appear to be KH-101 missiles launched by Russian bombers. Now, these are interesting missiles. They're stealthy, so they're difficult for Russian for Ukrainian radars to track. They are also they also maneuver, and they um, operate close to the ground. All of which makes it difficult to shoot down these missiles. And as I said, for the record, I get the impression that most of them do actually get through, despite the fact that the Ukrainian air defense system is reasonably well organized, or at least was reasonably well organized, and did have quite an effective toolkit at the beginning of the war. But it's important to say that these KH-101 missiles, difficult and complex to shoot down as they might be, are subsonic. And that does obviously facilitate shooting them down. It's, it's, they have their weaknesses and their strong points. Their strong points is that they maneuver, that they uh, fly close to the ground, that uh, they have very long range. I mean, if they can be launched from around the Arctic Circle and can strike targets um, across Ukraine, well, that shows how long range they are. And of course, and last but not least, they're stealthy and as I said, they're maneuvering. So they're not the easiest missiles to shoot down. But Kinjal missiles are a different thing again, because by all accounts, by everybody's admission, they are impossible, not just for Ukraine to shoot down, but from, for any military and for any air defense system to shoot down. The capabilities to destroy Kinjal missiles, hypersonic missiles, for the moment, simply don't exist. So, was it used? Well, the Ukrainians say it was. The Russians are not saying anything. They're not saying anything one way or the other. And perhaps we shouldn't expect that they would. But let's assume that one of these missiles was used. Why would it be used? Why would the Russians want to launch a Kinjal missile? Well, one possibility is that this missile was launched against a particular location in Ukraine, which was heavily defended, and the Russians decided that they would launch this missile because they wanted to destroy that particular um, target or location. And if that is the case, then I'm going to suggest that the most likely target in that case would have been part of Ukraine's air defense system. The Russians seem to be making an effort now to hunt and destroy Ukrainian air defense launches and air defense installations. And they seem to be doing it, um, again, incrementally, but we're getting this, uh, one gets the sense that this particular missile strike that took place yesterday did have a complex range of targets, and as well as the energy infrastructure, the air defense system was one. So it could be 
that the Russians used the Kinzhal missile because they wanted to attack a particularly heavily defended part of that air defense system. And that was why they used it, because they didn't want this particular missile to be shot down. And they knew that only a hypersonic missile would be guaranteed to get through to the target. So that's one possibility. Of course, there is another possibility, which is that the Russians are testing their Kinjal missiles, their hypersonic missiles. They are testing them. They're training them, training their pilots and air people in their use. And they are aiming to find what needs to be done, how these missiles should be guided and how effective they are hitting a particular target. Now, if so, and I'm going to say I think that is the most plausible explanation, why are these Kinjal missiles being tested in this way? What is, what are they being held back to do? Why, why are the, why is the use of these Kinjal missiles being fine-tuned in this way? Well, it seems to me that they are being prepared for use against some particularly important targets in Ukraine. Uh, some of the transport hubs in western Ukraine. I believe there's a tunnel there, for example, using Kinjal missiles to attack this tunnel. Might be a good idea. As I've said already, these missiles possess tremendous kinetic energy, quite apart from their um, explosive warheads. And they could perhaps do considerable damage even to a tunnel that's underground and therefore hardened. So perhaps that's one of the targets. But I still come back to my long-standing theory that ultimately the Russians might be fine-tuning use of the Kinjal in preparation for a missile strike, an eventual missile strike involving hypersonic missiles and perhaps KH-22 or 32 missiles, these big anti-carrier anti missiles that the Russians have been using in missile strikes over Ukraine, in which the Ukrainians have also admitted they can't intercept, by the way. Perhaps the Russians are using these missiles, are training with these missiles in order to prepare for that big strike against the Dnieper bridges, which may be coming. Now, bear in mind that 10 days ago, the Ukrainians were saying that at the time when the there was this attack on this, uh, rather this, this damage to this building, in apartment building in Dniepro, the incident which caused Aristovich's Alexei Aristovich, Zelensky's former spin doctor's dismissal. Um, when that happened, the Ukrainians both claimed that a KH-22 missile was involved and admitted that they could not intercept it. Now, of course, again, this is what the Ukrainians are saying. We can't be absolutely sure that there's much truth in what any Ukrainian officials tell us about that tangled story with contradictory claims being made by all sorts of people within Ukraine itself about that incident. But on the assumption that a KH-22 missile was indeed used, or perhaps more plausibly a KH-32 missile was used, then again that would point to the Russians fine-tuning and training to use these missiles in preparation for something, perhaps that attack on the bridges. And again, if the Ukrainians are right, maybe this use of a hypersonic missile in the missile strike yesterday was intended for the same purpose, in order to prepare to train operators in operating these types of missiles. Anyway, all speculation. I'm not pretending that I know what the Russians are planning.
the Russians obviously keep their plans to themselves. Their secrecy, by the way, about the, 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 the extent to which they've been able to conceal from all of us what they plan to do at any one particular point in time. Well, that's been remarkable, but it's been a story that's persisted throughout the entire conflict. So that's one thing to say about this particular missile strike. And I think that's all I can realistically say about it at the moment. Um, one day, no doubt, we will learn a great deal more about the Russian missile campaign. Well, what has been happening on the battlefronts? The big story now remains Donbass and the fighting that is going on in two locations. One is Vugleda, the other is Bakhmut. Now, let me start first of all with Vugleda. Um, yesterday, I provided a whole string of reports from Russian officials talking to TASS about the nature of the fighting in Vugleda. And um, it did seem that the Russians were very confident about their progress in Vugleda. And we had some Russian officials coming along and saying that once Vugleda is captured, that will create a crisis, an operational crisis for Ukrainian forces throughout southern Donbass. And in fact, will lead to the Russians being able to capture or liberate, as they would say, the entire area of southern Donbass, of Donetsk region. Now, today, we've had more information, but before I proceed with that, I should say that last night there were claims appearing not from official Russian sources, but from parts of the Russian internet that the Russians have cut all the roads to Vugleda and that the Ukrainian garrison in Vugleda is completely surrounded, or at least is effectively surrounded. There were some suggestions that they could still retreat across the fields, like the uh, Ukrainian forces that had been um, cut off in uh, Lysychansk back in the summer. They eventually retreated over the fields. Well, that may be true, but supposedly, according to these reports, the Russians were in control of all the roads. Now, I have to say that this morning, that's not quite the impression I've been getting from the latest reports, though the Russians do still seem to feel that they are pressing forward successfully in Vuglada, and they do seem to think that place will be captured fairly soon. We've had a number of reports. Firstly, there's a uh, report from um, Jan Gagin. Uh, in fact, both of these reports I'm going to publish are by, uh, talk about by Jan Gagin, who is an advisor to Denis Pushilin, who is the acting head of the Donetsk People's Republic. And Tass reports him saying the following. Uh, Fierce and severe battles are raging it on the Ugladar outskirts. We have indeed gained a foothold in the towns southeast and east, and fighting is on there and artillery is at work. Some groups are making attempts to get into the town to conduct reconnaissance by fire. And then he's also... Uh, reported as saying, uh, this is also by TASS, though it's a separate dispatch, our assault units are now mopping up uh, uh, Dacha, that's the summer house areas in the south of Vuglada. Fierce fighting is on and the enemy is biting. And then TASS reports Gagin is saying that control of Vuglada will enable Russian forces to halt the supply of the Ukrainian army with ammunition in Marinka, from where Donetsk is shelled. And in fact, this has been well established that Marinka and Vuglada are connected by road. If Vuglada falls, then the 
position of Ukrainian troops in the Marinka area becomes, well, unsustainable. That's anyway, those are the claims. Now, as I said, it's difficult to get a full sense of what's going on out of Ugladar. I saw other reports today that the Ukrainians are trying to rush reinforcements to the Vugladar area. The, these reports all came from the Russian side, and these reports also said that the number of troops that the Ukrainians are sending to try to hold the line at Vugladar is actually small. These reinforcements, the units involved, are small in size. I mean, I can't vouch to that. But that's what these reports claimed. They also claimed that they're being dispatched from the Bakhmut area. These reinforcements, which are heading towards Vuglada, are coming from Bakhmut. If that is correct, then it does appear as if Ukraine is no longer sending reserve troops from central and western Ukraine to try to hold the line in Vugladar. And that begs lots of questions. I mean, is it because Ukraine is running out of reservists? And I should say that there was a report on Ukrainian channels um, yesterday claiming that General Zaluzhny, the commander of the Ukrainian armed forces, has provided a report to the Pentagon detailing Ukrainian losses in the war and I have to say if these Ukrainian reports are true which I cannot confirm then the scale of the losses is bigger substantially bigger than some of the reports over the last few weeks have been saying I have pointed out, however, in the past that that figure of 100,000 men, which the Pentagon has been repeating for the number of Ukrainian troops um, who've been lost in the war, killed as far as I can understand in the war, well, th that report does now seem to be getting rather old and stale. It doesn't seem to be taking into account um, recent more recent Ukrainian losses and it's likely given the intensity of the fighting over the last few weeks in Bakhmut, in Zaporozhye region, in southern Donbass, on the Kremenaya Svatovo front, that those losses are now significantly greater than that figure of 100,000 that the Pentagon has circulated. Well, I'm not going to say what the figure that these Ukrainian sources claim uh, Zaluzhny passed on to the Pentagon. As I said, it's very high. It's, however, uncorroborated reports. I don't want to spread details like that about casualty figures which are uncorroborated. If you want to do your research, plough through the various channels, you will no doubt find that out for yourself. But I don't want to start making claims about a topic like that, which I can't remotely confirm. But of course, if it is indeed the case that these losses are as high as these reports claim, General Zaluzhny has told the Pentagon, well, that might explain why Ukraine is no longer able to send troops to the front lines in places like Vugladar from um, its reserve forces, um, why it's having to redeploy small numbers of troops from the even more important, the even more critical uh, defence lines in Bakhmut, and why we see a crisis evolving um, in Vugladar because it would seem in that case that Ukraine is indeed running short of troops. I have to say that I think a more likely explanation is that Ukraine has been told by the Pentagon that with Western equipment being uh, 
transferred to Ukraine and with plans to create two or recreate two additional brigades, perhaps three brigades, with all this Western equipment, all this equipment that's coming from the West. It seems to me likely that the Pentagon is now telling Ukraine that it is not, that it's prohibited in effect from redeploying its reserves east. Well, that may be true, but given how long it's going to take for all these brigades to be recreated with these Western armoured vehicles, these infantry fighting vehicles, these armoured personnel carriers, these tanks that are being supplied from the West, well, that means or would logically suggest that the Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut and in Vugladar and in other places are going to be denied effective reinforcement for several weeks, perhaps even months, with all that that implies for their ability to withstand these escalating Russian attacks that are taking place against them. Now, I would quickly say... Now, if that is indeed the case, if it is indeed the case that the Ukrainians are holding troops back to build up their reserves, then they are doing the same thing that the Russians are doing. Because as the Russians have confirmed, the Russians are building up a reserve force of 160,000 men, and that has not been committed to the battle. In fact, my impression, my clear impression, is that so far, the number of Russian troops who have been engaged in the fighting in Bakhmut, in Zaporozhye region, where the Russians have recently been on the offensive, in Vugladar and in the Svatovo-Kremenoya area, still only represent a small percentage of the total Russian forces being accumulated. And of course, if we take into account also the very large Russian forces that are now gathering in Belarus, which are distinct from this reserve force of 160,000, well, we begin to see the problems because in that case, the um, three brigades that the West is building up are going to be overwhelmingly outnumbered by the reserve forces that the Russians are creating. And this may explain some of the atmosphere of panic and hysteria that we see, or and euphoria, because panic and euphoria, as everybody familiar with these conditions knows often go together with all this panic euphoria hysteria agitation that we've seen in the west over the last few days and indeed in ukraine itself well that explains it because of course if all the west can do is build up let's say three brigades perhaps a force of 12 let's say fifteen thousand men in total well what is that going to achieve against a force of 160,000 men, which is the force that the Russians are building up? And the further 100,000 men that they are supposed to have in Belarus. So just, just as I said, keep all that in mind. Now, on that topic, um, just to... Um, finish off on a few points left over from the tank debate. As I said, the Germans have agreed to send 88 Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Of these, only 14 are going to come from Germany itself. The remainder are going to be contributed by other Western countries, European countries. Um, some of them will probably need refurbishment. Not all of these tanks are identical with each other. Um, some of them are in a state of some disrepair. Um, the German defence minister says that, Mr Pistorius says that they're all going to be sent to Ukraine by March. He's 
doing everything he can to get these tanks to Ukraine by March. Um, I have to say, if they are going to be sent to Ukraine by March, then certainly Ukrainian tank operators will not be trained up to the level to operate them properly, which does beg the question of who in that case is going to operate these tanks when they do eventually arrive. And whilst I'm on the subject of Mr. Pistorius, there's now reports coming from Germany that my speculations that uh, the forced resignation of the previous defence minister, Ms. 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 Lambrecht, uh, was connected with these tank deliveries is correct. It's now apparently being reported that Mrs. Lambrecht opposed Leopard 2 tank deliveries to Ukraine, and it seems that she was shuffled out in order to find a defence minister, in this case Mr. Pistorius, who was prepared to do it, overriding the strong opposition to the German army um, in connection with the supply of these tanks to Ukraine. Well, 88 tanks from Germany. Apparently, um, Poland is going to send another series of Polish-built, modernised um, T-72s. They have actually a different Polish designation. The core tank is the T-72. I'm going to say these are no doubt strong and effective tanks, but they reduce the total tank numbers within the Polish military fairly considerably. But anyway, those are also being committed. There's presumably those 20 tanks from Morocco, <laughs> which are going to find their way to Ukraine from the Czech Republic. As I said yesterday, I discussed the rather complex intrigue involved in the supply of these tanks. And we have the 100 um, infantry fighting vehicles, the Bradleys that have come from the United States, the tracked uh, Bradleys, the 40 Marders, some of which apparently are not in particularly good states of repair, and the 100 or so, the 90 wheeled striker vehicles and the French wheeled tanks. But the total number of machines will be enough to create around three brigades and as i said we can already see that the russian forces that have been concentrated will vastly outnumber this force even if one assumes which perhaps one should be as unwise to assume that these tanks are indeed superior to the tanks the russian military possesses now what about those 31 abrams tanks the american tanks i've already said that it's going to take many months for them to arrive in Ukraine. Um, yesterday, Victoria Nuland, the Assistant Secretary of State, who is one of the hardliners in this conflict, admitted that they would not arrive in Ukraine this spring, before this spring. And it's now been confirmed that they are going to be taken out of Pentagon stocks. But they will have to be stripped down their armoured panels are going to have to be removed and new armour will have to be placed on them in replacement because the very advanced armour the American tanks have is too secret to be risked in Ukraine if it falls into Russian hands well, then in that case, that armour and the way it works might be compromised and the United States, the Pentagon, is not prepared to do that. So that's going to inevitably delay the amount of time it takes to refurbish these tanks and, of course, training the Ukrainians to use these tanks is going to be a very, very complex affair. I'm not going to revisit all that. I've discussed that exhaustively. If you want to see good accounts of this, go again to Brian Belletic's uh, uh, channel, The New Atlas. He discusses this brilliantly, more authoritatively than I can ever hope to do. But I'm going to come back to the topic of these Abrams tanks later in this programme. Suffice this to say for the moment, 
that they're not going to be made ready. They're not going to be ready to be used over the next couple of months in Ukraine. I've seen some suggestions that they're not going to arrive in Ukraine until next year. That's what I get to say about Western deliveries. Now, yesterday, the British Ministry of Defence <laughs> devoted a disproportionate amount of its in daily intelligence bulletin to the T-14 Armata tank. This is this Russian super advanced, ultra high-tech tank, which the Russians first displayed in what is now clear was very much prototype form at a parade in Red Square uh, way back in 2015, and which has been under complex development ever since. And um, I ought to say that um, the British Ministry of Defence was very dismissive about the fact that this tank has not entered the Russian military in any big numbers, which is unsurprising given what a complex tank it is. It has lots of new technologies, including uh, the fact that it operates with an entirely remote controlled unmanned turret. There's all kinds of things that would probably need to be unscrambled. And besides, um, I get the impression that after the 2014 crisis, the Russian Defence Ministry decided that its electronics needed to be exclusively Russian designed and made. And that includes, by the way, the microchips. So getting all of the problems of this tank sorted out inevitably, inevitably is going to take a very long time. But last year, as I recall, um, the Defence Minister, Sergei Shoigu, said that an experimental batch of around 40 had, was about going to be delivered to the Russian military, and we were hearing reports that a further 100 were on the way. And, well, who's to say perhaps the Russian military will have around 100 of them um, by the end of this year or early next, or perhaps more? Well... That may not sound like a lot, but bear in mind, we're talking about 140 of the absolute latest T-40 tanks by the beginning of 2024, then that's still more than the, or about the same as the total number of Western tanks that are being sent to Ukraine. Now, that perhaps doesn't mean anything, as um, was pointed out by I.L. Gray, uh, Mike Jones, in a live stream we did uh, yesterday on the Duran. The bulk of the most modern tanks that the Russians are sending to Ukraine are the T-90M, which is actually also an advanced tank. It's probably more modern in some respects than these Western tanks. But, you know, if you want to talk about ultra top end Russian tanks, well, just making the point that the amount of Western tanks committed to this um, war is actually not greater than the total number of T-14 tanks that the Russians will probably have by the end of this year. And, of course, the T-14 is a much more modern tank than any of the tanks we're talking about. The Leopard 2, the uh, Abrams, the French Leclerc tank, if it ever appears, they all have their roots in the 1970s. Uh, that's not to discount their technical abilities or their effectiveness. Same is true of all the Russian tanks, including the T-90M, that are operating on the battlefield. But the T-14 would be a completely new, completely high-tech, ultra-modern tank. Perhaps the British, who cannot be unaware of this fact, maybe the reason they're scoffing at the moment at the T-14 is because they know <laughs> that it is indeed more modern and more advanced than their own tanks, Western tanks, and... <laughs> 
it will be starting to appear, perhaps in some numbers, perhaps in a few months' time. For the record, I don't think the Russians have any plans for the moment to deploy the T-14 in the war, but what do I know? <laughs> anyway, that all brings me to the important point about all of this, because VIPs, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, have now written a public letter to President Biden. Now, VIPs is, in my opinion, one of the most valuable institutions <laughs> that you will find in the United States. It brings together lots of retired US intelligence officers. Um, Ray McGovern is one of the two people, I understand, who brought this group together. They have an exemplary record. They spoke way back before the Iraq war about the fact that the Iraq war was based on faulty intelligence about Iraqi WMD, and they were completely right about that. They expressed strong skepticism and opposition about um, attacks on Iran and about the state of the Iranian nuclear program. They were absolutely right about that too. Their utterly brilliant reporting about Russia Gate, which is been almost completely ignored, has been comprehensively vindicated as far as I can see. And they've now published an open letter to Biden about the war in Ukraine. And um, it's quite long, so I'm not going to read it in full. I'll say that some of the people we all know and who've been commenting and discussing uh, this war. Some of them have appeared as um, guests on the Duran, uh, Larry Johnson, uh, Ray McGovern, um, uh, Scott Ritter. Well, their signatures are all there. But anyway, the long and the short of it all is this, that um, Biden is getting wrong advice. He's being given the impression that this war is going successfully when it is not people are telling him the intelligence people in the intelligence community are apparently telling him that the russians are running out of ammunition <laughs> that their forces have suffered massive losses all of those kind of things that is not true either he's been told or at least his officials are saying publicly that the russian attack on ukraine last year last year was unprovoked. Well, that is certainly not true. And he is being urged to seek a diplomatic off-ramp to try and find some kind of way to negotiate a compromise. And um, the, the public letter does make the point that at the Valdai conference on the 27th of October, Putin himself did seem to leave open a possible route towards some kind of negotiation to bring this conflict to an end. So this is a very powerful letter from the veterans, the VIPs, and I'm going to provide a link under the video and I would strongly urge people to read it. Now, what I've been saying, we can you can see what I mean here. We're talking about three Ukrainian brigades that are apparently being reconstituted, supposedly in order to launch some kind of offensive by Ukraine somewhere. This, even as Ukraine's army is bleeding, its army in battle is bleeding in places like Bakhmut and in Vugladar. And this, at the same time, as these enormous Russian forces are accumulating, which will overwhelm whatever these three brigades are possibly capable of achieving. Or at least so it seems to me. Unsurprisingly, and I discussed all of this yesterday and on other occasions and in programs on the Duran, 
Some people do understand this. Hardliners in the West do understand this. And they are talking about more weapons deliveries to Ukraine, fighter jets now, Attackham's missiles, all of those things. But the danger highlighted by the VIPs is that if you follow that kind of logic, given the overwhelming preponderance that the Russians can bring to bear in this battle, uh, then you are in a pathway to actual catastrophe. And this is the last paragraph of the VIPs letter, which I think makes the point most powerfully. There is a large conceptual and exceptionally dangerous disconnect. Simply stated, it is not possible to win the war against Russia and avoid World War III. It is downright scary that Defence Secretary Austin may think it possible. In any case, the Kremlin has to assume he thinks so. It is a very dangerous delusion. I completely agree. As I said, it's veterans, intelligence, professionals. For sanity, that is a sane statement. So much of what you read about Attackham's missiles, fighter jets, all those kind of things, in my opinion, are the pathway to its opposite, to the opposite of sanity. Well, you can work out what I mean. Now, whilst I'm on the topic of the war, one very last thing, um, there's been some interesting information about the situation in Bakhmut, where the fighting carries on, where, uh, by the way, there was a report yesterday that the Ukrainians have effectively conceded the entire town of Bakhmut, east of the river that cuts through it to the Russians, and the fighting in lots, lots of places in Bakhmut is now going on, and the ring around Bakhmut is tightening. But anyway, uh, a, a reporter from Al Jazeera, a team from Al Jazeera, visited a Ukrainian control room, staff command post of some kind, um, in Bakhmut, probably on its western outskirts, that part of Bakhmut, which is still under reasonably secure Ukrainian control. And they were allowed to film there, which I have to say does seem to me an extraordinary and very reckless breach of security. It was presumably done by Ukraine in order to try to give some impression that they're holding on successfully in Bakhmut after the loss of Solidar. Um, but as I said, I think that one consequence of that is that they've given away some information, perhaps already known to the Russians, but nonetheless, I think the Russians will be interested and will no doubt be analysing the film that Al Jazeera has broadcast from this situation room. And Riba, this rather um, effective Russian blog channel, which provides an interesting account of the war, and which, by the way, I notice is sometimes used now as a source by Western media as well. Anyway, Reba has um, examined the panels, the sort of screens, the TV and other screens, and it's been able to collate from what the information it's gleaned a picture of the Ukrainian units that are fighting in Bakhmut itself and its immediate environs. Now, I want to stress here, this isn't the total Ukrainian force that's gathered near Bakhmut itself. There's probably many other units. It's just the force which is being coordinated by this particular situation room and which is both inside Bakhmut and immediately around it. And Reba says that has identified the following units of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. The 24th Separate Mechanized Brigade, the 5th 
separate assault regiment. I believe that's a paratroop regiment. The Adam Tactical Group. I wonder what that means. But anyway, there it is. The Scala Reconnaissance Battalion. Now, that is the actual unit that is coordinating, that, that is in charge of this situation room. The 63rd Separate Mechanised Brigade, the 57th Separate Motorised Brigade, the 61st Separate Mechanised Brigade, the 45th Separate Artillery Brigade, the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade, Special Operation Forces Group, whatever that means, and the Ptahi Majara Tactical Group, whatever that means. But just count that that's one, two, three, four, five, six brigades and an assault regiment plus a special operations forces group, presumably those are special forces, and two tactical groups, the Adam tactical group and the Pratahim and the Majara tactical group. I'm going to guess that those are foreign volunteer fighters. That is a significant force defending a town which we are repeatedly told is of no strategic importance. Just say. Now, going back to the letter from Vips, we had suggestions, urgent suggestions, that President Biden, rather than risk World War III or a debacle, seek a diplomatic off-ramp. And there's now been a very interesting intrigue about this because the Washington Post has now published a interview um, between a, an interview which the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has uh, uh, given to um, the um, journalist, uh, uh, I think he's David Ignatius, who... Um, um, has um, provided, which has provided an overall account of American thinking at this time. Now, Ignatius um, is somebody who is widely believed, perhaps correctly, to have connections with the US intelligence community. He's somebody anyway who has um, some certainly certain contacts in the US intelligence community. And um, by the way, if I've got his first name wrong, I apologize. And the article is behind a paywall, so I don't propose to read it. But John Helmer has provided us with its text, and he's also provided an interesting comment about it. And um, Helmer makes the point that it's an interesting article because it appears to show that there is now finally some thought in the US government about starting negotiations. Now, before I get to this article, and discuss its contents and a follow-up comments that were made by no less a person than Victoria Newland. I do want to say something about uh, Helmer's article about this because Helmer um, says that there is a proposal, a diplomatic proposal being made by or in the works from the United States and this appears to acknowledge that the Russians will keep Crimea, but it also speaks about further territorial concessions, um, Donetsk and the other regions, Donbass and the other regions which have been annexed to Ukraine. Now, I have to say straightforwardly that I've read this article and like um, Eve, Smith, Eve Smith at Naked Capitalism, I, I don't find any mention of these proposed territorial concessions to the Russians at all, anywhere in it. Now, it could be that some kind of proposal has been communicated 
to the Russians by the United States and that it outlines these supposed territorial concessions and that Helmer has been told this by a Russian source. But I have to say, in fairness, that I think that that is unlikely or at least if it has happened, it would certainly surprise me indeed. Anyway, let's get to the content of this article, which is important. Now, the first thing to say is that the article, the interview between Ignatius and Blinken, contains a straightforward admission that the US doesn't really seriously expect Ukraine to be able to capture Crimea. That is simply not going to happen. The United States know, is hearing all this talk from Ukraine about capturing Crimea, but that isn't really something that is going to happen, and that really isn't something that the US really takes seriously. The, uh, the, the interview points out that there are, in fact, well, the article that covers the interv interview points out that um, there are, in fact, almost certainly Russian nuclear weapons in Crimea. So we're incredibly reckless um, to even consider trying to retake it. And this is what the article says. There is a widespread view in Washington and Kiev that regaining Crimea by military force may be impossible. Any Ukrainian military advances this year in Zaporozhye Oblast, the land bridge that connects Crimea and Russia, could threaten Russian control, but an all-out Ukrainian campaign to seize the Crimean Peninsula is unrealistic, many US and Ukrainian officials believe. That's partly, only partly, because you Putin has indicated that an assault on Crimea would be a tripwire um, for nuclear escalation. Now, the article goes on to say that the administration shares Ukraine's insistence that Crimea must eventually be returned, but it effectively accepts that that's not going to happen anytime soon. And um, it talks about one formula that interests the administration might be a demilitarized status for Crimea with questions of final political control deferred. Well, I, I have to say that's pie in the sky. There is no way that the U Russians would agree to that. And given that this article all but admits that Crimea cannot be recaptured militarily. Why would the Russians admit to that, uh, agree to, to something like that? And, um, and then the article, however, goes on to talk about other ideas. And they, this is where, in some ways, they become interesting. And this is the paragraph that, in my opinion, particularly interested me. And this is now again taking it from this article. Blinken's deterrence formula is somewhat different from last year's discussions with Kiev about security guarantees similar to NATO's Article 5. Rather than such a formal treaty pledge, some U.S. officials increasingly believe the key is to give, give Ukraine the tools it needs to defend itself. Security will be ensured by potent weapon systems, especially armor and well air defense, along with a strong non-corrupt economy and membership in the European Union. Now, that paragraph... If you take a step back and think about it, it all but accepts a central Russian demand that Ukraine should not join NATO. It says that US officials, some US officials, increasingly believe that um, 
There should not be a formal treaty pledge, neither security guarantees, nor Ukrainian membership of NATO, in other words, but that Ukraine's military should be built up instead to enable Ukraine to deter, to defend itself against the Russians. Now, I, I'm going to talk about in a moment the absurdity of this formula, at least from a Russian point of view. But note that what is being said here is that there will not be membership of Ukraine in NATO. There's going to be some kind of general peace settlement. Crimea will be demilitarized. Its political status will be decided in future. There's no way the Russians will agree to that. Ukraine's armed forces are to be built up with armor and anti-aircraft systems. But again, it will be outside NATO. No way the Russians are going to agree to that either. But that at the moment is the American plan. Now, that is very interesting because it is actually, at least to all appearances, a major concession if one were to reel one's way back to where we were a year ago. A year ago, the Russians were calling upon the United States to rule out further eastward expansion of NATO, which would, of course, apply to Ukraine. The United States categorically refused to do that. They said it was a fundamental principle and that they could not negotiate on the question of a country's uh, ability, willingness, uh, right to join NATO. Well, in this interview between Ignatius and Blinken, the Americans seem to be prepared to do precisely that. They seem to be on the brink of saying to the Russians, well, we accept that there will be no membership of NATO for Ukraine. And, of course, Blinken is also talking about the fact that there would be, as I understand it, as I've been able to read it, that there would not be um, strategic forces, US strategic forces, um, located in Ukraine. And um, I see to recall seeing that in the interview, but I can't see it for, for the moment. But anyway, um, that does seem to be part of the discussion that um, seems to be underway. And anyway, whether I'm right or wrong about that, we'll, we'll, we'll leave aside for the moment. But anyway, this is a first Acknowledgement that Ukraine cannot join NATO. And it does look like a signal to the Russians that, you know, we are prepared to sit down and talk and, you know, we're trying to find some kind of off-ramp to the war. And further sign that this is the case is that we've now had, directly following this interview between Blinken and Ignatius, a statement by Victoria Nuland that if the Russians pull back, they pull our forces out of Ukraine, the United States will start to um, start to cancel at least some of the sanctions it has imposed upon the Russians. Now, I have to say, if the United States had come along last year, told the Russians, we accept Ukraine can't be in NATO, told the Russians, we accept US strategic weapons, nuclear bombers, missiles, those kind of things cannot be in Ukraine. That might have served as a basis for some kind of negotiation, which might have led to a settlement of this conflict. The Russians would have insisted on implementation of the Minsk II agreement, they would certainly not have conceded control of Crimea, but there might have been some kind of negotiation, some sort of serious negotiation. And I personally believe that if the Americans had come up with some kind of proposal, not this proposal, but something 
that is not entirely unlike this proposal, then we would not have had a war. The war has, however, meant that we now find ourselves in a position where it is inconceivable that the Russians will accept this. And not only will the Russians not accept this, but there are so many problems with this from a Russian point of view. Because, first of all, there's no conceivable way, as I said, that they will accept any issue about the future status of Crimea. As far as the Russians are concerned, that is a done thing. And since even the Americans accept that it isn't realistic for Ukraine to try to recapture Crimea, why would the Russians surrender control of Crimea in that case? But this idea that the United States can just fill up Ukraine with weapons so they can defend itself and that it go on doing so and you know Russians are told don't worry about that you know uh, we guarantee you that Ukraine won't jo join NATO the Russians will never agree to this because they will see such a military build-up in Ukraine as a signal that not only is Ukraine going to go to get on the offensive to try to reassert its authority over its Russian-speaking population with all the results that we know. But it also means that the Russians will be quite sure that once Ukraine is built up to the level of military strength, that means that it can, at least in the American mind, repel an attack. Well, in that case, the whole question of Ukraine's NATO membership is going to be reopened. As both John Helmer and Eve Smith rightly say, there is no trust now between the Americans and the Russians. The Russians will not believe a proposal of this kind. They won't take it seriously. And quite frankly, given the recent history, who can be surprised? And in fact, Russian responses have not been slow in coming. Firstly, we've had a comment from Konstantin Gavrilov, a senior Russian diplomat who heads the Russian delegation at the Vienna talks on military security and arms control. And he said, we are ready for serious, straightforward talks, but I personally have not heard any kind of signal coming from the United States whilst here in Vienna. But we'll, we'll see. I don't see that Americans or Westerners here were in any form ready for talks. And then Gavrilov also said that the United States cannot be trusted. On the one hand, they declare their readiness for negotiations. On the other, they announce that they're sending Abrams tanks to Ukraine and prod the Germans to do the same. I don't think that our country can fall to such tricks. So that was Gavrilov, but an even more, shall we say, authoritative Russian uh, has now come forward, and that is none other than Dmitry Peskov, Putin's spokesman. And Tass says that he was asked about the possibilities of finding diplomatic ways to resolve the situation and replied, no, there is still nothing visible. We are not at all inclined to exaggerate the significance of the statements of uh, Mrs. Newland. Nothing new has been said. Notice that he ignores completely Blinken's comments to David in Ignatius. He said... And Peskov goes on to say, nothing new was stated. In fact, a set of theses was repeated, which indicates the absence of any manoeuvre or flexibility in the US position, which in turn is diametrically opposed to our position. So the Russians are having none of this. They don't believe Blinken. They don't believe Newland. They don't believe anything that the administration says for the moment. And certainly there is no conceivable way, especially with the war going their favour, why they would agree to the kind of proposals that Blinken is talking about. So I think 
this interview Lincoln has given to David Ignatius, and it is David Ignatius, his first name is indeed David Ignatius, David. Anyway, this interview is indicative. It is interesting that despite all the bluster, repeated by the way, in the Washington Post article about how well Ukraine is doing, how the Americans are finally, some of them at least, even ultra hardliners like Blinken and Newland are coming up with at least proposals for negotiations. But perhaps unsurprisingly, given that these are proposals coming from the likes of Blinken and Newland, the proposals are simply not of the sort that the Russians can even consider. I, I'm going to say for the record that I think that Blinken and Newland know this perfectly well. They're probably coming under some pressure, probably from some people in the Pentagon, probably from some European governments, perhaps Germany, for some kind of negotiation track to be opened to the Russians. And I think Blinken and Newland are pitching it at precisely the level where they know that the Russians can't possibly work with these kind of proposals. So I think this is really what this is about. This is a spoiler exercise, but it is nonetheless interesting that this is the sort of thinking that there's some discussion about negotiations going on. I do want to make two further points. Firstly, notice all the talk about building up the armor and anti-air cap capabilities of Ukraine after the war. Could it be, just possibly, that the Abrams tank delivery isn't really intended to change the battle itself, but is really a first step towards building up Ukrainian forces after the war is ended. In other words, that it's a first step towards implementation of Blinken's plan. That's just a thought. I don't know. But secondly, regardless of what Blinken and Newland are up to exactly, and as I said, I don't believe that any proposals they make are being made in good faith. And of course, the Russians as Gavrilov has said, don't think so either. But let's assume the very fact that they're talking about negotiations at all does suggest that the heat is on. In Germany, public opinion polls are now showing overwhelming opposition to the delivery of fighter jets to Ukraine. I think this is there's a potential for this to cause severe splits within Germany itself and within Europe. And Macron, of course, is taking a very strong line supporting Ukraine. But my impression, again, is that this policy is not popular at all in France. And I can see that going forward, um, Maloney in Italy may find that she's running into similar problems. So there's this. And of course, as the VIPs people have correctly said, the options really come down to this. A military debacle in Ukraine when the Russians win. World War Three, with all that implies, or some kind of diplomatic settlement. And I can't help but think that whatever it is the Germans are saying in private, the pressure is on probably coming principally from the Pentagon and perhaps some of the economic agencies of the Europe of the American government to try and persuade the administration to come to some kind of a compromise to find a way to end the war. I make no prediction that this will succeed. The forces arrayed against it are huge. And we see the kind of things that Blinken and Newland are saying. But it is an interesting fact in itself, and obviously it's something to follow and keep track of. Well, that's me for the day, another long inter uh, video, and um, no doubt there will be further military developments over the next few days in Vugladar and in Bakhmut, and we'll come to all of those when they arise, and no doubt lots of other things will be happening as well.
In the meantime, all that remains is for me to remind you that you can find all our videos on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, um, uh, uh, Rockfin, and Telegram, that um, we have, uh, that you can also um, um, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video, that you can also, um, if you wish, um, go to our shop, buy the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you've liked this video, to check your subscription and to tick the like button to this video. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.